This is a non-biased examination of Genesis 2 and is not affiliated with any religion or doctrine. All required research was done independently on my own and is protected by copyright unless otherwise noted. A transcript of this presentation will be available at indigoflower.net and can be translated into various languages using Bing or Google. In a previous video, we looked at Genesis 1, which seems to describe the terraforming of the earth by the Elohim. And Genesis 1 also indicates the Elohim were a group of benevolent beings that were either human or humanoid that were responsible for creating the conditions on earth that would sustain life and were also the ones who either created all life on the planet or brought forth all the life. In other words, brought the life here. In this video, we're going to look at Genesis 2, which introduces Yahweh, who it says acquired the earth, established Mesopotamia, and made humans their servants and used one of the cells from humans to create a hybrid that could mate with humans. This investigation will confirm what we looked at in a previous video, that the Bible says Yahweh is the beast impersonating God, and the Nephilim are breeding with humans right now. So in this video, we'll be using the definitions of the original Hebrew words from blueletterbible.org, biblestudytools.com, and biblehub.com, the lexicon view. So if you want to follow along, the links are in the description below the video on YouTube. So the King James translation of Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And in the lexicon, the direct translation says, The sky of the earth was complete and all war. So we know the word for sky, number 8064, also means atmosphere. And so it can also be translated, the atmosphere of the earth was complete and all, or number 3605, which means the whole or all throughout. And this word, number 6635, means war or warfare. So another translation of Genesis 2 verse 1 can say, the atmosphere of the earth was completed, then all throughout there was war. In other words, sometime after humans were put here, wars began. And then verse 2 in the King James translation says, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So we know the word for God, number 430, means Elohim and it's plural. So the word his in this verse and also the word he should be they. And then also notice the first word for and is not actually in the original text. So verses two and three can also read, but on the seventh day the Elohim ended their work which they had made and they rested on the seventh day from all their work which they had made. So the Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it they had rested from all their work which the Elohim created and made. So this is saying after the Elohim made the earth a paradise, there was war everywhere, but the seventh day is the blessed day. And we know one day equals a thousand years, so this could also be saying the seven thousandth year is the blessed millennium. And that's an important statement that is code, but we'll talk about that in another video. For now, we'll move on to verse 4. So notice verse 4 introduces a new name for God. All throughout Genesis chapter 1, the word for God was Elohim, number 430, which means divine ones. And in Genesis 2, the word for God remains Elohim until verse 4, and then the name for God changes. So the King James translation says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So notice the word God, number 430, which means Elohim. It's still present, but this word Lord in all capital letters is now introduced. So in the Old Testament, the word translated as Lord in all capital letters is usually, but not always, 
word number 3068, which is Yehovah. And we discussed this in a previous video that the original Hebrew word, word was Y-H-W-H without the consonants. And sometimes it's pronounced Yahweh or Jehovah. And Hosea 13 with Revelation 13 tells us Yahweh acts as the beasts of Daniel and Yahweh is the beast with seven heads and ten horns. And we also looked at Exodus 6.3, which says the Lord did not appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name Yahweh, but appeared to them instead by the name God Almighty or El Shaddai. And that seems to be an important statement because we know the word Yahweh is used in all three of those stories in the Bible. So the current translations of the Bible tell us Yahweh was, was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For example, if you look at Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2, it says the Lord told Abraham to leave his country and his father's house, and the Lord would make him a great nation. And we know the word translated as Lord in Genesis 12 is Yahweh. So there are only two possibilities here. Either Genesis 12, 1 is correct, and Yahweh was the God of Abraham, or Exodus 6, 3 is correct, and the God of Abraham was not Yahweh, but El Shaddai. So both verses cannot be true. So because Hosea 13 and Revelation 13 explain for us that Yahweh is the beast, it seems that Genesis 12, 1 would be false, and Exodus 6, 3 is giving us a clue that the texts have been altered. And Jeremiah 8.8 8 seems to confirm that. The King James translation says, How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain he made it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. But when we look at this word translated as vain, number 8267, we can see it's translated the majority of the time as false or falsehood or deception or lie. So Jeremiah 8.8 8 is telling us the law of Yahweh was made in falsehood. The pen of the scribes is in falsehood. And that seems to confirm what Exodus 6.3 is telling us, that Abraham did not know God by the name Yahweh, yet the name Yahweh was inserted into the story of Abraham. And Jeremiah indicates that is because the pen of the scribes is in falsehood. In other words, the texts were altered at some point. And that doesn't mean everything in the text were altered, but it does mean that at least some of it was. So we should use common sense when we read the material. For example, when we read in Exodus 30, 16, number seven here, that Yahweh required money in order to make atonement for the souls of the Israelites, we can be pretty sure that was not the Elohim who terraformed the earth, making it habitable for life because the Elohim chose not to to dominate the earth, which they had the full opportunity to do, but instead they let humans have dominion on the earth. So the Lord in Exodus 30, 16 sounds more like the beast who were told acted as Daniel's beast, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, which represented the Babylonian empire, the Persian empire, the Greek empire, and the 10 horns of the fourth empire. And that may be telling us that the texts were altered during that time period. So as we go through Genesis 2, we'll keep that in mind. The King James Version indicates in verse 4 that Yahweh created the whole earth, but we know that contradicts what Genesis 1 already told us, that the Elohim created the earth. So the Bible tells us Yahweh is the beast, and the word Yahweh itself, number 3068, stems from the word 1961, which means fall out, and that's compared to 1933, which also means to fall, and that is compared to 0183, which means to desire, covet, or be greedy. So verses 4 and 5 in the King James translation say, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they are created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So the first word word in verse 4, number 428, means these, but it also means those. So verse 4 can also be translated, 
Those were the generations when the heavens and the earth were created. And we already know the word translated as heavens, number 8064, also means atmosphere. So the first part of verse 4 says those were the generations when the atmosphere of the earth was created. So we'll add that here. The atmosphere of the earth was complete. Then there was war. But on the seventh day, the Elohim blessed the seventh day. Those were the generations when the atmosphere of the earth was created. And then the second part of verse 4 says, And the day that Yahweh God made, or word number 6213, which also means to acquire property, so it says, and the day that Yahweh God acquired the earth and the atmosphere. So you can see we're still in verse four. Those were the generations of the atmosphere and the earth when they were created. And in the day that the Yahweh God acquired the earth and the atmosphere, every plant of the field or word number 7704 which means cultivated field. And the definition of the word cultivated is raised or grown on a farm or other or under other controlled conditions. So by the way, um, everything that every word that has a number here is the actual Hebrew word, everything else is a filler word. So for example, at the beginning of verse five, where it says, and every plant, that phrase right that whole phrase right there corresponds to hebrew word 7880 so that's what we're looking at right now we're just looking at the words that have numbers everything else is a filler here so we we just want to look at the the hebrew words themselves so it's saying here the plants cultivated field you can see there's only two hebrew words there plants and cultivated field so we have plants in verse 5, plants and cultivated field. And then this word that was translated as before, it's word number 2962. And it means not yet. So verse 5 says the plants were not yet in a cultivated field. In other words, they were not yet grown under controlled conditions in the earth. And we know the word Translated as earth, number 776 also means land. So this can also say the plants were not yet in a cultivated field or grown under controlled conditions in the land. Then it repeats the same basic phrase for the herbs. It says, and the herbs cultivated field not yet grown. In other words, the herbs were not yet grown in a cultivated field or not yet grown under controlled conditions. And then the word translated as for, number 3588, means because. So the plants were not yet in a cultivated field in the land and the herbs were not yet grown in a cultivated field because the Yahweh God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And we know the word 776 translated as earth also means land. So it can also say in Yahweh, God had not caused it to rain upon the land. And there was not a man. And we know that word for man, number 120, also means human being or humans. So the plants were not yet in cultivated fields yet because Yahweh had not caused it to rain upon the land, and there was not humans to till the ground. And this word translated as till, number 5647, it means to serve as subjects or to make oneself a servant. So verses 4 and 5 can be translated, those were the generations when the atmosphere of the earth was created. And in the day that the Yahweh Elohim acquired the earth and the atmosphere, the plants were not yet in cultivated fields in the land, and the herbs were not yet grown under controlled conditions, because the Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain on the land, and humans were not made servants to till the ground. So that makes sense because the Elohim 
did not put humans on earth to be servants. In Genesis 1, it told us the Elohim made the earth habitable and put the plants and trees here for food and gave humans dominion over everything. But it did not say they forced humans to farm the food. It said the plants and the fruit trees had their seed in themselves. Now it's saying, in the day when the Yahweh Elohim acquired the earth, plants were not being cultivated, so the humans were not growing their food under controlled conditions when the Yahweh Elohim acquired the earth. Then the King James translation of verse 6 says, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So we know the word translated as earth, number 776, also means land, and the word translated as face, number 6440, means surface. So verse 6 says, And then there went up a mist from the land and watered the whole surface of the ground. And then verse 7 of the King James translation says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we know the word Lord is Yahweh, but this word translated as formed, number 3335, means to, pre, to be predetermined, preordained, or purposed. So the Yahweh God purposed, and we know word number 120 means humans, and the word translated as dust after that, number 6083, means mortar. And mortar is a mixture of cement, lime, or sand and water that hardens and is used in masonry or plastering. So it's a form of concrete. So it says the Yahweh God purposed the humans to make mortar and the word translated as of, number 4480, also means ground. I'm sorry, it means out of. It means, 4480 means out of. So the Yahweh God purposed the humans to make mortar out of, out of the ground. And then the word translated as breathed, number 5301, also means to blow. So that's, that was the word breathe, number 5301. It also means to blow. So Yahweh purposed the humans to take mortar out of the ground and blow. Then the word translated as nostrils, number 639, also means ground. So the Yahweh purposed the humans to take mortar out of the ground and blow the ground. Then the word translated as breathe, number 5397 means blast. It's a noun, so it doesn't mean to blast, it means a blast. So Yahweh purposed the humans to take mortar out of the ground and blow the ground a blast. Then the word translated as life, number 2416, means community. So blow the ground a blast for a community. Then word 120, we know means humans, and then word 2416 again, which we know means community, and word 5315, which means life or person or persons, in other words, people. So verse 7 can also be translated as Yahweh Elohim purposed humans to make mortar out of the ground, to blow the ground, a blast, for a community of humans, a community of people. And this makes sense because in the construction process of building a city or a structure, the use of mortar or what we would call concrete in modern times is one of the most important components and sometimes it's necessary to blast the bedrock in order to dig the foundation. That's what it says right here. And this concept would not have been understood prior to the ninth century when black powder, the earliest known explosive, was allegedly invented in China. And I say allegedly because there are other ancient texts that indicate that not only were explosives being used thousands of years ago, but possibly even nuclear explosives. 
the ancient Indian text called the Mahabharata, which is dated between the 8th and 9th century BC, describes a weapon called the Brahmastra that sounds a lot like an atom bomb. These are some quotes from Wikipedia on the weapon. It says the land where the weapon was used became barren and all life in and around that area ceased to exist as both men and women became infertile. There was also a severe decrease in rainfall with the land developing cracks like in a drought. After a Brahmastra is used, the event is described as an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns rose in all its splendor which reduced to ashes the entire race. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable, their hair and nails fell out. And then the article also mentions Robert Oppenheimer, who was a developer of the modern atomic bomb, and he actually quoted from the ancient Indian text, the Mahabharata here. He quoted from that text after the atom bomb was detonated. And when he was asked later if the atom bomb that exploded during the Manhattan Project, if that was the first one to be detonated, he answered, he answered, well, yes, in modern times. So it seems even the government is aware of the ancient nuclear explosives. And of course, if they had nuclear explosives back, back then, then they must have also had black powder, simple um, explosives. So um, that the nuclear weapons is also explained on the television series Ancient Aliens. It's called Deadly Weapons, and it's in Season 3, Episode 9. So, but the point for this video is that the Indian text that describes this weapon, the, the Mahabharata text, is believed to have been completed by the 4th century CE, but the origins of it fall between the 8th and 9th centuries BC. And one of the main subjects of the text is the Karukshatra War, which is believed to have occurred between 6000 BC and 500 BC. Different scholars have arrived at different dates, but the most common date for this war is believed to be 950 BC, and that ties into our investigation of the name Yahweh. The first archaeological evidence of the name Yahweh occurred in the 9th century BC, specifically in 840 BC on the Mesha still. So this war that the ancient Indian text indicates was a nuclear war is dated to the same period when the name Yahweh showed up, and that may be significant. Other scholars have dated this alleged nuclear war as early as 3143 BC, 3067 BC, or 2559 BC, which would line up with the start of Mesopotamia. So the Bible tells us Yahweh is the beast whose mouth was the Babylonian Empire. And the origin of the Babylonian Empire was the city of Babylon, which is dated to around 2300 BC. And it existed until about 141 BC. And Babylon rose out of Mesopotamia the fertile crescent, which is otherwise known as the cradle of civilization because of the rise of cities as we recognize them today, and also because of the invention of writing. It's also credited for the invention of the domestication of animals and agriculture. It says here it was one of the earliest sites of planned sowing and harvesting of plants and irrigation which it says were developed after the Neolithic Revolution. So the Neolithic Revolution is sometimes called the Agriculture Revolution, and it says here it was a wide-scale transition from hunting and gathering food to planting food in a settlement, and they say that transition started around 12,000 years ago, and then during the next millennia, the hunter-gatherers built up villages and towns, and it says at the bottom of this that the first full-blown manifestation of the entire Neolithic complex is seen in the Middle Eastern Sumerian cities, that's Mesopotamia, 
whose emergence also heralded the beginning of the Bronze Age. And the Bronze Age, I believe, was around 30, it started around 3300 BC. So Mesopotamia turned into Sumer, which turned into Babylonia. And this is the same region that the Bible says Yahweh planted their garden. So Genesis 2, verses 8 through 14 in the King James translation say, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which encompassed the whole land of Havilah where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, there is Belium and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon, the name is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia, and the name of the third river is Hittichel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. So we know the Euphrates is in Iraq. So that tells us that Eden was somewhere near modern-day Iraq. There are several scholars who have focused on locating Eden, but it's usually believed to be somewhere near modern-day Iraq because we're told the Euphrates comes out of it. So Genesis 2 tells us Yahweh planted a garden somewhere near modern-day Iraq, and Yahweh developed irrigation and agriculture in this region and purpose the humans to make mortar out of the ground and blast the bedrock to build a community. And Iraq is the location of ancient, ancient Mesopotamia, where farming is believed by scientists to have first prospered. And also, this is where the Babylonian Empire rose up, the first major city right here, the first major empire, rose out of this area right here. First it was Sumer and what they call the Assyrian Empire, then it was Babylon and the Babylonian Empire. So the Bible tells us Yahweh had the mouth of the, of the Babylonian Empire. So Deuteronomy 32 says, Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. And this ties right into this. It says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, because I will publish the name of the Lord and ascribe your greatness unto our God. He is the rock, a God of truth, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. So the first point in, sorry, the first point in Deuteronomy 32 is that these are the words of the mouth. And that ties into Revelation 13, which says the beast had the mouth of the lion Babylon. So this may refer to something that took place during the Babylonian period. Then verse 3 in the lexicon says, Proclaim the name Yahweh, give greatness God. And the word translated as give, number 3051, also means a scribe. And a scribe means to credit or assign, to attribute or think of as belonging. And the word for God here is number 430, which we already know means Elohim. They were the ones who created the conditions on the earth. So verse 3 says, publish the name Yahweh and attribute to Yahweh the greatness of the Elohim. And then verse 4 in the direct translation says, The rock's doing or deed is perfect in all its manner of judgment. And that makes sense because we've already put the puzzle pieces of Daniel and Revelation together with the words of Jesus, and it tells us the rock represents at least on one level, the future asteroid impact. We're told throughout the text that it will be a judgment that will destroy the beast. And here again, we're told its deed is perfect. Okay, and then notice the next word for God in verse 4 is L. 
So it says L's firmness or steadfastness is not injustice. It is just and right. And this word L, number 410, it means mighty one or mighty heroes. And it says it's shortened from the word 352, which means ram or chief. So Deuteronomy seemed to be clarifying the relationship between Yahweh Elohim and El. It says the name Yahweh was published and the greatness of the Elohim was ascribed to Yahweh. But what the rock or asteroid is going to do is perfect in all manner of judgment. El's steadfastness is just and right because in verse 5 they have corrupted themselves. And then verses 8 and 9 in the King James translation say, the Most High divided the nations and separated the sons of Adam. The Lord's portion was Jacob, and it was a desert land. So when we look at the lexicon, we can see the word for Most High is word 5945, which is the word Elyon, or Elyon, and it means Most High or Highest. So verse 8 says in the direct translation, the Elyon took possession of the people, took possession and divided the sons of mankind and stood at the border of the people and tallied the sons of Jacob. And then verses 9 and 10 in the direct translation say, and Yahweh's territory was the people of Isaac's territory and the property was attained in the wilderness or word 4057, which also means desert. So it says the property was attained in the desert. The land was a howling emptiness. It was waste. So verses 8 through 10 say the Elyon or Elyon took possession of the people, took possession and divided the sons of mankind and stood at the border of the people and tallied the sons of Jacob. And Yahweh's territory was the people of Isaac's territory and the property was attained in the desert. The land was a howling emptiness. It was waste. And then in the King James also, it says in verse 10, it clearly says Yahweh's portion was the desert. It was the desert land. And then it goes on to say Yahweh led the people there and made them ride on the high places of the earth. And then verse 15 in the lexicon says, and the upright ones grew fat and kicked. They grew fat and gross, gorged with food. And left God, but this is, this can also say permitted God to make them into fools, but the rock will be their salvation. But notice that word for God in this verse is a different word. It's word number 433, which means Eloah, and it means God or false God. So it says they permitted Eloah to make them into fools, but the rock will be their salvation. So verse 15, an excerpt of that says, and the upright ones grew fat and kicked. They grew fat and gross, gorged with food and permitted the Eloah to make them into fools. And then verse 17 says in the King James, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. But then if we look at the lexicon, it says in verse 17, they sacrificed to the demon Eloah and the Elohim knew. And then it says new went in or new gods went in and then the word 7138 which means next 
So new gods went in next, who their fathers, and then 8175, which means be very afraid or be horribly afraid. So notice the negative is not here. The negative also is not in Blue Letter Bible Translation or in the Bible Study Tools Translation. So verse 17 seems to be saying, they sacrifice to the demon Eloah and the Elohim knew. New gods went in next who their fathers were horribly afraid of. And then the King James translation goes on to say in verses 18 through 24 that they forgot the God that formed them. And Yahweh said, I will hide my face from them. And I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. A fire is kindled and shall consume the earth and set on fire the mountains. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat. So we know that that the burning is mentioned over, over, over and over throughout the text. And Daniel and Revelation indicate that the burning is from the burning stone, the millstone that falls from heaven that will destroy the final empire. So the asteroid. And we know it's, it's all in riddles and codes. So when it says here in verse 31, their rock is not as our rock. Their vine is, a, is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. It's definitely referring to the asteroid impact there because Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed by the fire and brimstone falling from heaven. And then it says, the day of their calamity is at hand and the things that shall come upon them make haste and that basically means it will happen suddenly and it says that all throughout the text in revelation it says it will occur literally in one hour so there's no question the rock represents at least on one level the asteroid that's coming daniel makes it clear that it's something that hasn't happened yet so um this De Deuteronomy 32 seems to explain several things. First, it says, hear the words of the mouth, which we're told later is the mouth of the beast, which is Yahweh. And then it says, Yahweh is the name that was published and attributed the greatness of the Elohim. And the Elyon are the ones who separated humans and Yahweh was given the desert land. And this is when it says the people started worshiping false gods. It was at the publishing of the name Yahweh, the mouth. And we're told the mouth of the beast was the lion Babylon, which was Daniel's first beast, the Babylonian Empire. So Deuteronomy 32 seems to say that is when the name Yahweh was published and also when the people started worshiping false gods. And it also makes a point of saying that Yahweh's territory was the desert. And that makes sense because Genesis 2 tells us Yahweh planted a garden where the Euphrates comes out, where modern day Iraq is, and that's the desert. And so Genesis 2 says the plants were not growing there because Yahweh had not yet caused it to rain in the land. So it wasn't raining because it was a desert, and that makes sense. And then it says Yahweh caused a mist to come up from the ground. So it sounds like an irrigation system was set up at that point. And then it says Yahweh purposed the humans to make mortar out of the ground and blast the ground to build a community. And that's where we left off in verse 7. And then next, verse 8 says, And Yahweh God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So the word translated as planted, number 5193, also means established. And the word translated as garden, number 1588, also means enclosure or enclosed garden. So the, it says the Yahweh Elohim established an enclosed garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man. And we know the word translated as man, number 120, means humans. And the word translated as formed, number 3335, means framed, predetermined, or purposed. 
So the Yahweh Elohim established an enclosed garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the humans he had predetermined. But we also know the word he is not appropriate because Genesis 11 establishes that the Yahweh is not a he, but a they. In verses 6 and 7, it says, And the Lord said, Let us go down and there confound their language. And we know the word Lord in this verse is Yahweh. So it, Yahweh is not a single person. It's a group who said, Let us go down. And they scattered humans. So the word he in chapter 2, verse 8, should be they. So verse 8 says, And the Yahweh Elohim established an enclosed garden eastward in Eden, and there they put the humans they had predetermined. And then verse 9 in the King James says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it makes sense that the Yahweh created irrigation in the desert and planted a garden and caused to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food in the desert. It even makes sense to say the Yahweh grew the trees of life because that may refer to the fact that food causes life. However, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is strange and people have been speculating about what that might refer to for generations because it doesn't directly tell us what that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was and it's not the direct title of a fruit. So at this point in the story of Genesis 2, things start to sound strange. So what we're going to do is examine these words closely and see if we can make sense out of this because it ties into Genesis chapter 3 as well and the rest, rest of the Bible. So verse 9 in the direct translation says, In the land Yahweh Elohim sprung up, or word number 6779, which means bring forth or brought forth. And then also the first word in verse 9 in the Blue Letter Bible translation is word 4480, which means among. So it's saying among the land, Yahweh Elohim brought forth all the trees that were pleasant in appearance and good for food, the trees of life. And the word for life, number 2425 here, also means alive. And the word that's used in the Blue Letter Bible for life in this verse, in verse 9, is 2416, and that also means alive. So it's saying the trees that were pleasing in appearance and good for food, the trees that were alive. And in the midst of the enclosure, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that may indicate that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not a living tree because it makes a point of saying okay, Yahweh grew all the trees that were alive, but also in the midst of the enclosure, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So notice the word translated as tree, number 6086, also means shaft. So in this enclosure, there are all kinds of trees for food, living trees, but in the midst of the enclosure, there is a shaft of knowledge or word number 1847 which also means skill so the shaft of the skill and then word 2896 which means prosperity so the shaft of the skill of prosperity and then word 7451 which means harmful so in the midst of the enclosure, the shaft of the skill of harmful prosperity. So verse 9 can literally be translated to say, And among the land the Yahweh Elohim brought forth all the trees that were pleasant in appearance and good for food, 
trees that were alive, but also in the midst of the enclosure, the shaft of the skill of harmful prosperity. And then verses 10 through 14 talk about the location. A river went out of Eden and became into four heads, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. And then verses 15 through 17 in the King James translation say, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden, Eden to dress it and to keep it and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it for in the day that you eat thereof you will surely die so we know the word translated as Lord is Yahweh we know the word translated as man number 120 means humans we know the word translated as tree also means shaft The word translated as garden also means enclosure, and the phrase tree of the knowledge of good and evil also translates to shaft of the skill of harmful prosperity. And this word that was translated as eat, number 398, it also means to consume or use. So verses 15 through 7, sorry about that. Verses 15 through 17 can also say, And the Yahweh Elohim took the humans and put them into the enclosed garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Yahweh Elohim commanded the humans, saying, Of every tree of the enclosed garden you may freely eat, but of the shaft of the skill of harmful prosperity you shall not use it, for in the day that you use it you will surely die." That's interesting because we know days can also be years and we also know days can be a thousand years. So that's going to tie into Genesis 3. Um, Then verse 18 in the King James translation says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And this word translated as meet, M-E-E-T, it's not a typo. It's actually in the definition. Um. And by the way, that word meet, it does not mean mate. Um, So you can see the Bible Hub definition is here. It does not include that word meet. Um, It is in the Blue Letter Bible definition. You can see it's here. But the word meet, M-E-E-T, according to the Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges, it means suitable or adapted to. So the word meet does not mean mate. And, um, and the word, the phrase help meet, as it is here in the King James, it actually does not mean mate. And that seems to be important. And then the other important point is verse 18 does not provide the Hebrew word for not in the statement. So when it says it is not good, um, the only original Hebrew word Provided there is number 2896, which means good. So you can see the lexicon also does not include the negative. It's not specifying the negative. So it says here, Yahweh Elohim said it is good that mankind is separated. Will make them helpers. And then this word 5048 right here also means demoralized so verse 18 can literally be translated to the Yahweh Elohim said it is good that humans are separated we will make them demoralized helpers and that makes sense because we already looked at Genesis 11 which says in verses 6 through 8 that the Yahweh purposely confused the language of humans and scattered them so purposely separated them. So the Hebrew negative is not specified here. So it says Yahweh God said it is good that humans are separated. And that does seem to match the overall biblical context better. It's confirmed in chapter 11 verse 8. The Yahweh want humans to be separated and scattered. Because the Bible tells us they are the beast. So number one here, the Yahweh is not a he, but a they. Genesis 11 says, let us go down. Number two, they told Abraham to leave his father's house and go to Canaan. And Canaan was cursed by Noah, who was a just man who walked with Elohim. 
They promised Abraham they would make him a great na nation if he left his father. Exodus 6.3 says the Lord was not known to Abraham as Yahweh, but as El Shaddai. Exodus 30.11-16 says Yahweh demanded money in exchange for atonement. Exodus 32 says they commanded their followers to kill their brothers, companions, and neighbors. Numbers 31 says they commanded their followers to kill children and their mothers. Deuteronomy 32 says the Yahweh name was published and credited with the Elohim's greatness. And Jeremiah 8.8 8 told us Yahweh made the law in falsehood and some of the fault, some of the writings are false. Deuteronomy 32 tells us the Elyon took possession of the earth and Yahweh's portion was in the desert, which Genesis 2 tells us was near the Euphrates River, which is in modern day Iraq. And Genesis 2 tells us Yahweh established agriculture and ir irrigation in that area, which modern scientists refer to as Mesopotamia. And then Mesopotamia turned into Babylon. And Hosea 13 tells us Yahweh will be unto them as a lion, bear, and leopard, and will devour them. The beast will tear them. And Revelation 13 tells us the beast is like a lion, bear, and leopard. And Daniel told us the lion was Babylon. And Revelation says the beast has the mouth of the lion Babylon. So those are just a few of the connections that tell us who Yahweh is. And we're actually going to need a page two for Yahweh now because we know Moses was with Yahweh in the desert wilderness for 40 days and Jesus was in the desert wilderness for 40 days except Jesus said no to the proposed agreement which is possibly why the name Jesus means salvation Yahweh. Um, he sa Matthew 1 tells us he saved his people from their sins and their sins included following false gods. So this is not a co complete list right here, but um, we'll just we'll keep that for later. The point for now is that the translation Yahweh said it is good that humans are separated. We will make them demoralized helpers. That's a legitimate translation, and it also matches the context of the whole biblical message, the fact that the Bible is telling us that Yahweh is the beast. Then verses 19 in the King James says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And the direct translation says, In the land the Yahweh Elohim formed, or number 3335, which also means preordained or predetermined. So in the land, Yahweh Elohim preordained all the animals of the land and all the flying creatures of the sky to go to mankind to see what to call all of them. And mankind proclaimed to the living creatures names. So verse 19 can also say, In the land Yahweh Elohim preordained all the animals of the land and the flying creatures of the sky to go to the humans to see what to call all of them, and the humans proclaimed to the living creatures' names. And then notice the King James decided to use the Hebrew word for mankind in verse 19, but capitalized it, making it the name. But this word Adam is still word 120 as you can see here and it means human being or humans and genesis 1 already make made clear in verse 27 that word 120 refers to all humans both male and female and again word 120 is adam so this refers to all humans, both male and female. So in verse 19, you can see it's the same word, word number 120. But now the scribes have capitalized it as though it's the name of one man, but it's not. Genesis 1 was clear and specific about this word. Word number 120, the word Adam refers to both male and female humans 
And Genesis 5 confirms that again. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam, male and female created he them and called their name Adam. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. So that makes sense now because it wasn't a single man who lived 930 years. It was the first humans, both male and female, who lived in 930 years. So it, this seems to clarify that these names do not represent single individuals, but tribes. So for example, later it talks about the tribe of Jacob. And so it, it seems like each of these names here, Adam, Seth, all of it, it seems they, they um, represent tribes of humans. And this is important because it helps to clarify what Genesis 2 is really saying. So verse 19 is telling us the humans both male and female, named all the animals. And then verse 20 in the King James translation says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not a help meet for him. And the direct translation says, And mankind proclaimed names for all the animals and flying creatures in the sky. And all living things in the land. And then notice this last part of verse 20 is almost identical to verse 18. It says, man attained to be a helper. Um, this translation uses the word number 121 for man, which is also the word Adam. Right here, word number 121 is Adam capitalized. And it says here, it's the same as word number 120 which we know means human being so again adam it's the same word here adam is the word for humans it tells us both male and female so notice in genesis 5 the words 120 and 121 are used interchangeably so in verse 1 the word for adam is 121 and in verse 2 the word Adam is 120 and then in verse 3 it's 121 again and then also notice here the word Yahweh is not used in this section the word for God is number 430 which we know is Elohim the divine ones who Genesis 1 says terraform the earth so in chapter 5 is in agreement with chapter 1 it was the Elohim that created humans not Yahweh or put them here brought brought them forth and and genesis 1 tells us they were named adam both male and female and that's what genesis 5 is confirming um and we're told word 120 and word 121 are the same right here it says word 121 capitalized adam is the same as word 120 adam which means human being so Genesis 2 verse 20 in the Blue Letter Bible uses word 120 for Adam in verse 20 right here. And the Bible Hub translation uses word 121 for Adam, but that's okay because it's the same word and the definition of 121 says it's the same as word 120. So this word number 121 is the same word Adam that means humans. So it says the humans attain to be helpers. And then this word 5048 is this word right here, which we already looked at, which means demoralized. So remember at the end of verse 18, it used the same word, number 5048, which means demoralized. It said humans were separated and made demoralized helpers. And now verse 20 is saying the humans attain to be demor or attain to demoralize helpers but the word translated as attain to number 46 72 also means acquired or secured so it's saying the humans acquired demoralized helpers so in verse 18 the yahweh said it's good the humans are separated we will make them demoralized helpers and that implies the humans themselves 
were the helpers of the Yahweh, which we find confirmation for in other parts of the Bible. And then in verse 19, Yahweh brought the animals to the humans. And in verse 20, it says, And the humans proclaimed names for all the animals and flying creatures in the sky and all living things in the land. And the humans acquired demoralized helpers. So this indicates it's a chain of command. The humans were made the demoralized helpers of the Yahweh and the animals then became the demoralized helpers of the humans. And we can see this chain of command still exists today. But it wasn't set up by the Elohim. Genesis 1 says the Elohim did not intend to dominate humans. They gave humans dominion over the earth and gave them food that had its seed in itself. But Genesis 2 says, When the Yahweh acquired the earth, they made humans their servants to till the ground and plant food and build cities and gave the humans the animals to act as the servants of the humans. So it sounds like a cycle of bondage for both the humans and the animals to serve this beast system. And this trans transition seems to have transpired over a long period of time because remember Genesis 5 said the Adam, the first humans, lived 930 years. And then verse 21 says in the King James, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So again, this word translated as Adam is word number 121, which is the same as word 120, which means humans. And the Bible Hub translation is still using word 120 in this verse, which confirms that the direct translation says, And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon mankind. And as they slept, they took one of their ribs, or word number 6763, which also means cells, And notice the NAS concordance says this word originates from an unused word. And it defines the word here as chambers, but the origin of the word was unused, possibly because it represents something that was unknown at the time. So it says here the word stems from the word 6760, which says it's a primitive root, probably meaning to curve. So a curved chamber or cell that was something they didn't use or it stemmed from something that was unused, possibly because it referred to something they didn't know existed yet a curved chamber or a curved cell. So in the context of this verse, it says Yahweh causes humans to sleep and one of their curved chambers or curved cells was taken and the flesh was closed up. So it's, it, it's telling us that it's a curved chamber or cell that is under the flesh. And it makes sense that the early scribes thought it was a rib because they knew that ribs are part of a rib chamber that is curved. But we know now that a curved cell can also refer to a human cell that is not only under the flesh, but within the flesh itself. So Genesis 2 verse 21 can also say, And Yahweh caused a deep sleep to fall upon mankind, and as they slept, they took one of their cells and closed the flesh underneath. And also this word translated as one, number 259, it also means a certain. So it's saying they took a certain cell, and then 5462 means closely joined. So it can say they took a certain cell and closely joined the flesh underneath. So verse 21 says, And the Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon humans, and as they slept, Yahweh took one of their cells and closely joined the flesh underneath. 
And then verse 22 in the King James says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And the direct translation says, The Yahweh Elohim built, or number 1129, which also means to be built up. So Yahweh built up the 802, which is the Hebrew word Isha. So Yahweh built up the Isha with the cell that was taken and take, I'm sorry, taken from mankind and brought to mankind or brought the Isha to mankind. So verse 22 reads, the Yahweh Elohim built up the Isha with the cell that was taken out of humans and brought the Isha to the humans. So the word Isha is defined in the Strong's Concordance as woman, wife, female, each, every, one, or married. But the Bible makes it clear that this word cannot refer to a human female or even a human at all. So first of all, the word for man in verse 22 is word number 120 which is the Hebrew word Adam and means human being. And Genesis 1.27 makes a specific point of saying that word, number 120, Adam, refers to both male and female humans. And chapter 5 confirms that the word Adam refers to both male and female humans. It says they called their name Adam. So this is the first point. The Bible specifically says that the word Adam refers to all humans, both male and female. And then second, Genesis 2, 21 and 22 tell us the Isha was made from a cell taken from Adam and man, words 120 and 121. So we're told word 121 right here, Adam is the same as word 120, Adam, and it means human being or human. And Genesis, so Genesis 2, 21 and 22 use the words 120 and 121 interchangeably to represent the same thing. Adam, humans, both male and female. And it makes clear that the Isha, number 802, is made from the cell that was taken from Adam. So that's the second point. The Isha was made from a cell taken from Adam. And that means the Isha is different from Adam. In other words, the Isha cannot be Adam if the Isha was made from Adam. And because the Bible established clearly that Adam represents all humans, both male and female, the Isha therefore cannot be human, neither male nor female. So, but we know the Bible says that Adam had children with the Isha in Genesis 4.25. So the Isha creates children with Adam who we're told are the male and female humans. In other words, the Bible is telling us the non-humans are procreating with humans. And that's confirmed in other books of the Bible. Genesis 6 tells us the sons of God were marrying the daughters of mankind and having children with them before the, the flood. And Genesis 2 is describing events that occurred before the flood. So it says here, the women were mating with the sons of God. And now we're about to find out the men were too. It was the early humans who mated with the descendants of the gods, both male and female. So the Isha bears resemblance to the sons of God described in Genesis 6. And we're also told this Isha, this word Isha stems from an unused word. And we also know that the word translated as rib, which also means cells, 
That word also stems from an unused word, so it's possible they didn't use the root word because it's talking about genetic engineering, and that's something the scribes did not understand when these texts were translated. So verse 22 says, The Yahweh Elohim built up the Isha with the cell that was taken out of humans and brought the Isha to the humans. And then verse 23 says in the King James, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we already know the word Adam, number 120, means humans. And notice the word translated as she, number 2063. It's the same word used in the sentence before. It means this. So in the direct translation, it says, Mankind said, this is the foot, bone, bone. And this only makes sense once we understand the book of Daniel, because Daniel said the feet represent the final empire that will be destroyed by the asteroid. We looked at this in a previous video. Daniel 2 says, during the feet the final empire, someone will be mingling with the seed of men. In chapter 2, verse 43, it says, And whereas you saw the iron mixed with clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And this is talking about the feet and toes in verse 41, the feet and toes of the fourth empire right here. It doesn't specify in Daniel who is mingling with the seed of men during this time. Um, it, 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 it indicates that it's the ten kings, but it doesn't specify who they are. Um, it indicates it's happening at the time of the ten kings. So in a previous video, though, we found the connections between Daniel 8.10, which occurs at the time of the little horn, which comes out of the ten kings, and we know the ten kings rule at the time of the feet. And that says the army of the stars fell to the earth, the oppressors. And in Revelation 12, 9, we're told the dragon is cast out to the earth. And we're told the dragon is cast out after the war in the sky, which we found out seems to refer to World War II. The great dragon was cast out. It was cast out into the earth. And the Nephilim in Genesis 6, 4 whose name means fall out. It says they mate with humans when humans begin to multiply on the earth. And we know the human population growth began went exponential after World War II. So again, we found out in Revelation 12 that it seems to say the dragon was cast to the earth after World War II. And the word, the word Nephilim in Genesis 6 means fall out. And Genesis 6 tells us they mate with humans when, when humans begin to multiply on the earth. And the growth curve went exponential after World War II right here. So there's no other time in recorded history that the human population grew so quickly. You can see it took a sharp turn upward between 1927 and 1960 during and after World War II when the Bible says the dragon was cast to earth and when Daniel says they are mingling with the seed of men during the feet. And when Genesis 6 tells us the Nephilim are mating with humans when humans begin to multiply. So the text seemed to have been written in the prophetic perfect tense. It was written as though it was about the past, but it's about the future. The end is also the beginning, as it says in the first chapter of the last book of the Bible. So that's how we know who is mingling with the seed of humans. It's the dragon, the Nephilim. We know they're, we know they're not human because Daniel says they mingle with the seed of humans, but they don't cleave to one another. So it says this is happening at the time of the feed in Daniel 2. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And that word seed is important because it's not just talking about mingling with humans. It's talking about mingling with the human seed. And the seed 
is the procreation mechanism. The, the fruit is the offspring, and the seed is what creates that offspring. So it says here that whoever the iron is, they are not able to procreate with humans, with the clay. And if the iron is not able to procreate with humans, that means they must not be human. They're a different species. And it's a reference to the Nephilim, except it tells us the Nephilim are successful in mating with humans. So Daniel says there was a problem with the seed. The clay would not cleave to the iron. But in Genesis 6, we're told the descendants of God succeed in producing children with humans. And that happens before the flood. And the events described in Genesis 2 take place before the flood. So this Isha, we know, is not a human female. It is not human at all. We proved that. The Isha seems to be a hybrid that Yahweh makes so the seed of humans will cleave to the iron, which is the dragon. Because next in verse 24, it says, Therefore shall man cleave to the Isha. But first we have to finish verse 23. So again, it says in verse 23, mankind said, this is the foot, bone, bone. So this is the bones of the feet. It could say right here, the feet, the final empire, when Daniel says they mingle with the seed of men. So it's telling us right here in Genesis 2, 23, mankind said, this is the bones of the feet, the bones and the flesh, the flesh, and then word 71, 21, which means be chosen. So the flesh will be chosen of the Isha because of what was taken from man. That's one translation. And if we look at the blue letter Bible format, the translation comes out slightly different. We know word 2063 means this, but it also means this one. So verse 23 can say, and the humans said, this one is now, or the word translated as now, number 6471, we know also means feet, foot or feet. So verse 23 says, And the human said, This is the feet bones, or this is the bones of the feet and the flesh. The flesh of this one shall be called, or number 7121, which also means chosen, so the flesh of this one shall be chosen. Then word 802, which we know is the word Isha. So the flesh of this one shall be chosen, the Isha. And then notice they don't include the Hebrew word for because. It's not here. It just says this one shall be chosen, the Isha. This one was taken or Number 3947, which also means Mary. So it can say, this one shall be chosen, the Isha, this one will marry man. And notice the word translated as man in this verse is number 376. It's the word Ish, and it means husband or human being or mankind. So the flesh of the Isha was chosen to marry humans. So verse 23 says, And the humans said, This is the bones of the feet, the bones and the flesh. The flesh of this one shall be chosen, the Isha. This one will marry the humans. So it's saying the humans, both male and female, are marrying the Isha at this point. So again, the Bible makes it clear logically 
that the Isha cannot be human. But the word is defined in Strong's Concordance as woman, wife, female, or each, every, or one, and married. And you can see Isha was translated as the word one ten times in the Bible. So we'll take note of the definition right here. And it says in Strong's that the word Isha stems from the word 376 or 582. So 376 is the word ish, and it means husband or human being or mankind. It was also translated, though, as one, the word one, 188 times in the Bible. So we'll add that definition here. It says isha may stem from ish, which means husband and human being, but it also means one. But it says the word isha may also stem from the word 582, which is the word inaush, which also means husband or mankind, but it's translated 10 times in the Bible as the word certain. So this word isha that's translated as wife in so many scriptures, it stems from, it says in the Strong's Concordance that it stems from either the word ish which means husband, or the word enosh, which also means husband. But it tells us here in the NAS concordance that the word isha stems from an unused word. So which of these words is unused? Well, it can't be husband because these words are translated all the time as husband. So if the word isha stems from an unused root, as the NAS concordance indicates, then it cannot stem from the word husband. But the common denominator between all three of these words is obvious. It's the words one and certain. So Strong's indicates the word isha stems from either ish or inaush. If the word stems from ish, then the definition one would apply because you can see both the word isha and the word ish both mean one. So if the word isha stems from the word ish, as Strong's concordance indicates, is a possibility, then the definition one would apply. But Strong's indicates that it's not sure which of these words isha stems from. It could also stem from inaush, it says, in which case the word certain becomes closest because the other definitions of inaush mean human and we know isha is not human. So if the word isha stems from the word inaush as Strong's indicates as a possibility, then the definition certain would apply. So the common denominator between all three of these words is certain one. So the more accurate definition of the word isha would be one or certain one in the Genesis 2 context. And we also know the isha was the chosen one to marry the human. So it is a mate. It's just not a human female mate. It's not a human mate at all. When we put the puzzle together, it looks like the isha is a hybrid that makes it possible for the Nephilim to procreate with humans. Verse 24 seems to confirm that. Verse 24 says in the King James, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the direct translation says, So upon this, the man, or 376, which means human being or mankind, the humans, so upon this, mankind will forsake their father or word number one, which also means forefathers or ancestors. So the humans will forsake their ancestors. And then the word number 517, which means point of departure or division. 
So the humans will forsake their ancestors at the point of departure or division and cleave to the Isha, the 802, which we know is the word Isha, or a certain one. So at the point of division, they will cleave to a certain one, the Isha, and become one flesh. So verse 24 says, So upon this, the humans will forsake their ancestors at the point of division and will cleave to the Isha, and they will become one flesh. And then verse 25 in the King James says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And the direct translation says mankind, and then number 802, Isha, were both naked. And the word translated as naked, number 6174, also means bare. And that's going to tie into Genesis 3. So then after that, so it says the man, mankind and the Isha were both bare. And the word number 954, which was translated as not ashamed, it means ashamed and it also means confounded or confused. So verse 25 can be translated, and the humans and the Isha were both bare and were not confused. It's translated as not, not confused. So... You might notice here the negative is not in this verse. Um, it's also not here. The, the actual Hebrew word, it was translated as not ashamed, but the Hebrew word for not is not present here. It's also not present here on Bible study tools either. You can see the, the actual Hebrew words are highlighted in blue here. So I'm not sure why the negative is not there. It is in the interlinear translation right here you can see that's the word for not but the context of the negative does match what we're told next in genesis 3. so an alternate translation of genesis chapter 2 says and we'll just go through the highlighted parts here the atmosphere of the earth was completed then all throughout there was war but on the seventh day the elohim blessed the seventh day those were the generations when the atmosphere of the earth was created and in the day that the yahweh elohim acquired the earth the plants were not yet in cultivated field in the land i'm sorry were not yet in cultivated fields in the land because the Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain on the land, and the humans were not made servants to till the ground. And Yahweh Elohim purposed humans to make mortar out of the ground, to blow the ground a blast for a community of humans. And the Yahweh Elohim established an enclosed garden eastward in Eden, and there they put the humans whom they had predetermined. And among the land the Yahweh Elohim brought forth the trees that were alive, but also in the midst of the enclosure, the shaft of the skill of harmful prosperity. And a river went out of Eden and became into four heads, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. And the Yahweh Elohim took the humans and put them into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Yahweh Elohim commanded the humans, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the shaft of the skill of harmful prosperity you shall not use it, for in the day that you use it you will surely die. The, Elo the Yahweh Elohim said, It is good that humans are separated. We will make them demoralized helpers. And the Yahweh Elohim preordained all the animals to go to the humans. And the humans proclaimed names for all living things in the land. And the humans acquired their demoralized helpers. And the Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon humans. And as they slept, Yahweh took one of their cells and closely joined the flesh underneath. And the Yahweh Elohim built up the Isha with the cell that was taken out of humans and brought the Isha to the humans. And the humans said, This is the bones of the feet. The flesh of this one shall be chosen. The Isha will marry the humans. 
So upon this the humans will forsake their ancestors at the point of division, and will cleave to the Isha, and they will become one flesh. And the humans and the Isha were both bare and were not confused. So that's it for this week. If you want more information, the whole series playlist, Bible's Countdown to the Asteroid, is linked here. And there are several other videos that are linked in the description be below the YouTube video. Just click on Show More to open up more links on the subject. And if you like this video, please consider providing support. These presentations are funded by viewers like you. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who is making this research possible. I hope you're doing well, and I'll talk to you next week.